We've come now to the sixth lecture of the course Paradise Lost in Slow Motion, hosted by the Antrim Literature Project, which is a public humanities platform dedicated to making the study of literature accessible to readers beyond the paywalls of the university. I'm joined over Zoom this evening with students of the course. We're going to meet after and uh, discuss uh, book six. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to pick up where I left off from last week's lecture in our consideration of sound and sense. There are certain moments in this epic where the lines take on a lyrical quality. You'll remember from lecture zero, our introduction, that like many epics, Paradise Lost is encyclopedic. It tries to encompass everything, kind of like that giant compass we're going to see um, being used in book seven to circumscribe the world. Uh, it tries to enclose everything, and that that's not just subject matter, but also form. And reading the book, reading the poem, requires a certain kind of sensitivity to the shapes of sound and meaning. And in these lectures, I want to help you develop that sensitivity. So we're going to be picking up on that. Raphael continues his narration of the war in heaven. The faithful Abdiel returns from the troops of the rebels, suffering scorn and derision, and is met at the Mount of God with praise. The Father sends out uh, his angels for battle. Now, you've probably noticed that this account is strange. It's so entertaining, so fun. I think it rivals the Marvel and DC movies that we have today and its special effects. Uh, there are mystical chariots, gunfire, um, cannon, cannons, strange melee. And I think the poet wants us to keep in mind the description uh, that the descriptions of the war are in a way translated. Uh, remember in the previous book when Adam asks Raphael to tell him the war in heaven, Raphael is perhaps reluctant at first, but this is what he says. I just want to share that passage. It came up in our discussion. But for those watching on YouTube, this might be a helpful refresher. So Adam asks, asks Raphael about this matter, and Raphael says, High matter thou enjoinst me, O prime of men, sad task and hard. For how shall I relate to human sense the invisible exploits of warring spirits? How without remorse the ruin of so many glorious wants, the perfect while they stood? How last unfold the secrets of another world, perhaps not lawful to reveal? Three reasons here, he says. And here's why he does it. Yet for thy good, this is dispensed. And what surmounts to reach of human sense, I shall delineate so by likening spiritual to corporeal forms, as may best express, as may express them best. Though what if earth be but a shadow of heaven, and things therein, each to other like, more than on earth is thought. So there is some translation. I want to highlight the return of Abdiel and the description of day and night within the Mount of God, which was very fascinating. You know, Adam in his hymn said that when he was praising God, the morning hymn said, in whom there is no or, or day without night. And when I was when I came across that in this past reading, I thought, well, that's not quite true because there is day and night in heaven. He describes it here. But it's not quite night. It's day. It's something like twilight. We're gonna see here. Here's Abdiel returning. All night the dreadless angel unpursued through heaven's wide campaign held his way till morn. Waked by the circling hours, with rosy hand unbarred the gates of light. It's a beautiful figure. The idea comes from Homer and, um, to some extent, Hesiod. The idea that the the sequence, the spatial sequence of the, of the firmament, the hours are spinning in the firmament, and as they they turn, um, they bring the time along. And of course, we know this 
as coming from Homer. We covered that in the Backgrounds to English Literature, the Greeks lecture. The idea that the hours unbarred the gates of light, which we see in Spencer, um, the hours doing the same thing. They were daughters of Job there, and they are porters who have the key to the gates. Just a beautiful figure in its own right. And here's the part. There is a cave within the Mount of God, fast by his throne, where light and darkness in perpetual round lodge and dislodge by turns, which makes through heaven graceful vicissitude like night and day. Light issues forth, and at the other door obsequious darkness enters, till her hour to veil the heaven, though darkness there might well seem twilight here. And now went forth the morn, such as in highest heaven, arrayed in gold imperial. And when he comes to the mount, Abdiel comes to the mount, God from his golden cloud. It's interesting, God is never quite visible. Servant of God, well done. Thou hast fought the better fight, who single hast maintained against revolted multitudes the cause of truth, in word mightier than they in arms. And for the testimony of truth hast borne universal reproach, far worse to bear than violence. With his word, he withstood the armies, mightier than in violence. So in a way, it's as though this verbal argument, this wrestling, this confrontation that we saw between him and Satan, and, or rather Lucifer and his legions, Lucifer who will become Satan, um, is the greater fight. And that what we're about to see is merely the, the physical uh, fight, and it's somehow not as not as impressive as the verbal exchange that we heard occur. And then God sends out his armies. Go, Michael of celestial armies, prince, and thou military prowess next, Gabriel. Lead forth to battle these, my sons, invincible. Lead forth my armed saints, by thousands and by millions ranged for fight, equal in number to that godless crew rebellious. Them with fire and hostile arms, fearless assault. And then we have this scene, it's very much like Exodus 19, when the law is given to Moses. So spake the sovereign voice, and clouds began to darken all the hill, and smoke to roll in dusky wreaths. Love that image of dusky wreaths. Reluctant flames, the sign of wrath awaked. Uh, this is very, like I said, very much like the giving of the law to Moses in the book of Exodus. Um, so that's the scene. They, are, they go forth to meet Satan and his armies uh, on the campaigns or the countryside of heaven. In Abdiel, we find the character of one who was true to the good against the sneers of his tribe, uh, who withstood the entire nation of, of Satan, what would be hell. Alone, and I can't help but think of Milton himself, who in later decades after the restoration of the monarchy suffered similar scorn and was met with derision and at least the threat of violence. Um, thinking of Abdiel traversing alone the wide countryside of heaven back to the throne, I think is not unlike Milton, or at least how Milton sees himself as he is in his solitary blindness as an exile in the world below. And perhaps he even expects the commendation, um, well done, the good servant. Uh, so that's interesting. Abdiel uh, has the first strike. The, he's the first one to initiate uh, the, the combat. I think that's fitting. We, we'll see that soon. And the Messiah King is the one to finish the fight. And in a way, there's kind of a picture of the Messiah King when he descends to earth uh, and is surrounded by enemies and then returns with praise to the Mount of God as in Abdiel. So I find that kind of interesting to think of Abdiel as 
maybe Milton, maybe Christ, but there's definitely this overlapping uh, imagery there. All right, now I want to consider some of the battle scenes, you know, two battle scenes, uh, but I want to consider it with, an, with ears for sound. You know, Milton's Paradise Lost is written, uh, it's completely written in blank verse, over 10,000 lines of iambic pentameter, and a work of this length requires variation. We saw some examples of, of this variation last week. The lines must vary from slow to fast. They must sometimes flow softly with a liquid grace. They must sometimes gallop and crash in cacophony. At times, the, the poetry, the sounds, the lines, they startle us. And sometimes the sounds lead us on. Sometimes um, they trip us up sometimes causing us to fall, frustrating our expectations, or even exposing our prejudices and what we expected. The lines, they bellow, they bark, sometimes they hiss and screech. They whisper like evening wind sometimes, and sometimes they drop upon our ears as gently as morning dew, and it all depends on what the poet is speaking of. And this is the art of the poet. It's the art of any poet. And my students in the classroom, I mentioned this, and the viewers on YouTube sometimes think that I read too much into the sound of a work. Um, just this week, somebody submitted a Q&A question, which I'll, I'll, I'll give attention to in a separate video, but they said something like, I can't imagine John Keats counting syllables on his fingers when he was writing those sublime sonnets. You don't actually think that poets are really careful this way. And in a way, I, well, I can't picture that either. I think John Keats could write perfect pentameter without counting on his fingers because he just internalized it. It became so natural to him, as he said, like leads to a tree. Um, but he certainly was aware of the meter. My attention to sound and sense, as we'll see, isn't just dissecting the poem like a science experiment. It's to heighten your awareness and increase your sensitivity to the bodily experience of poetry. You can't come to a poem like Emerson's disembodied eyeball, the intellectual all in all. You must bring your ears. Your whole person is engaged with the poetry. Uh, so let's talk about pace. Because no line of iambic pentameter is exactly the same. Take this example here. Um, I'm indebted to Brooks and Warren's textbook that I recommend on this channel, uh, Understanding Poetry for this example here, two great, really well-selected passages. Notice the pace. We're talking about how quickly something moves, the line of verse. This is from Keats. Mid hushed, cool rooted flowers, fragrant eye. You have to read that slowly. Mid hushed. Cool rooted flowers, fragrant eye. It's iambic, except for this spondy, which causes us to pause. It's immediately after a, a caesura. There's also these clusters of consonants that are causing us to articulate them, to pronounce them hushed, cool rooted flowers, fragrant. I. Uh, it's drawn out. Compare that to a line of Alexander Pope, the rape of the lock, which means the stealing of, of the lock of hair. It's a hilarious, uh, mock, heroic poem. If you ever get a chance to read it, Pope is a master of pentameter, iambic pentameter. How soon they find fit instruments of ill. How soon they find fit instruments of ill. There's a quickness there. Uh, it's It skips how soon they find, and you've got the fit instruments, the uh, short vowels here that quicken it, I think, but also a little bit of monosyllabic uh, words there along with instruments, which is also a quick word. So you get an example of how these lines, how a line can be differently paced. Now, last week, we saw how a line of Shakespeare's sonnet imitated the rhythmic ticking of a clock. 
Now, I want to introduce you to the idea of incremental stress. Um, sonnet 12, when I do count the clock that tells the time, the consonants, the steady I ams, all are imitating the ticking of a clock. Um, but, but not every stress is stressed equally. And to prove this, or to argue for this, some scholars, some uh, metricists, have pointed to this sonnet by Sir Philip Sidney. It's from his Astrophil and Stella sonnet cycle, his sequence. Uh, it predated Shakespeare's sequence. Shakespeare certainly read it. Now, if we were to scan it, we'll see that with each stressed syllable, the stresses get stronger. With how sad steps, so moon, thou climbs the skies. That first line is often used as an example to show how stresses vary. We have two very weak I ams here with how sad steps. We have another I am immediately following, O oh moon. And if you were to say it conversationally, I think you would find that O oh moon is a stronger stress than with how. With how sad steps, O oh moon. And then you'll find that this I am is even stronger than the one preceding it. Thou climbst, and that long I, long vowel, climbst the skies until you get to this final loud stress of the skies. It's louder partly because the, the long I here is not encumbered by this cluster of consonants. Climbst the skies, but it has this liberating sibilance at the end. So when you get that eyes, it just kind of leaps and disappears on the breath as though leaping into the air. And so in a way, the incremental strength of these, of these feet are imitating the rising of the moon. Some people still protest. Um, you don't think that the poet is really aware of all of these intricacies. Uh, you're just reading too much into it. Uh, but Alexander Pope tells us that the good poet is aware of these intricacies. He or she must give minute attention to the way sound shapes meaning, and a good poet leaves nothing to chance. I've covered this passage on the channel before, but this is going to be, this is going to set us up quite nicely, I think, for the battle scenes that we're going to hear from Milton. Here's the principle. Alexander Pope says, true ease in writing comes from art, not chance, as those move easiest who have learned to dance. Tis not enough no harshness gives offense, the sound must seem an echo to the sense. The meaning must be echoed by the sound. Here's the first example. He then gives us these brilliant examples. Soft is the strain when Zephyr gently blows, and the smooth stream in smoother numbers flows. Right? So when you're talking about Zephyr, the god of the west wind blowing, your lines, your numbers, your feet must be smooth. And you notice, too, how, it, how the, the, the feet are not only softened by the, by the stress, but also by this S sound throughout strain. It's, it's a very smoothing consonant, and then the repetition of the word smooth here, uh, smooth and smoother, that rounds it off, kind of shaves off the edges of the, of the line. And also, see what's happening to your mouth when you read this out loud. Soft, the ah. Um, it's an open mouth, the, the blow, the very breathy vowels, uh, ooh, and smooth and numbers flows. It's, it's open. Um, it's, non it's not constricted by the teeth or the tongue. And so you can see how it, this is bodily, not only in hearing, but in speaking. Next example. But when loud surges lash the sounding shore, the hoarse rough verse should like the torrent roar. When speaking, when describing the, the waves upon the rocks, the poem must sound that way as well. We have surges 
uh, which is the G there is kind of soft, anticipating the SH consonants in shore and in lash. Um, the horse, repetition of that OR in shore, which finally resolves in roar. You have that growl of the R in closing that OR sound, and so it's onomatopoetic. Again, when Ajax strives some rock's vast weight to throw, let me clear this up here and scan this. When Ajax strives some rock's vast weight to throw, see this spondy? It's metrically weighted. He's not just trying to get us to see that, oh, look, you're stressing where the weight is in the content. It actually slows us down, and it swings into the I am at the end of the line with the stress syllable there with throw. The rock's vast weight. You can feel the labor there as the line is stressed with the double weight with the two syllables. The line, too, labors, and the words move slow. And this inclusion of two separating the subject and the verb slows us down like the laboring line. The words move slow. And now he gives us an example of swiftness. Not so when swift Camillo scours the plain, flies o'er the unbending corn, and skims along the main. It's the skipping meter. We see that there. Um, and again, the, the short, short eyes there quickening it. Here, how Timotheus varied lay surprise, and bid alternate passions fall and rise. The meter has to imitate the alternate passions, and so he throws in um, the dactyl, and bid alternate passions fall and rise to disrupt the iambic meter, adding in that syllable, an, an eleventh syllable here for this foot. So, I hope you, you do see that um, it's not chance, it's art. And there are portions of this poem that you should probably not be looking for the confluence of sound and sense. Like in book one of Paradise Lost with the roll call of the devils. And I don't think there's much sound and sense being blended there. All the language is doing that long roll, roll call is simply... Um, um, contextualizing with poetic language. I want to bring our attention now, having established this principle of sound and sense, to go to the first strike of the battle. When Abdiel gets his first hit, and it's not without um, a speech. So there, Abdiel and Satan, both armies, facing off together. To whom, in brief, thus Abdiel stern replied, Apostate, still thou errest, nor end will find of erring. From the path of truth remote, unjust thou depravest it with the name of servitude to serve whom God ordains or nature. God and nature bid the same when he who rules is worthiest and excels them whom he governs. This is servitude. To serve the unwise are him who hath rebelled against his worthier, as thou, as thine now serve thee, thyself not free, but to thyself enthralled. Yet lewdly darest our ministering upbraid, our ministering upbraid. Reign thou in hell thy kingdom, let me serve in, God, in heaven, God ever blessed, in his divine behests obey, worthiest to be obeyed. We've already gone over this, but he's giving it to him again, now in the company of all the rebels and all of, of heaven's hosts. We have this idea of, reign thou in heaven, in hell thy kingdom, which now we're, we're beginning to see wasn't really an original thought for Satan. It was a remembrance of Abdiel's condemnation, which takes away from the heroic grandeur of that, of that line when we encountered it in book one. So, okay. Yet chains in hell, not realms expect, 
Meanwhile from me returned, as erst thou saidst, from flight, this greeting on thy impious crest receive. And then he goes for the strike. So saying, a noble stroke he lifted high, which hung not, but so swift with tempest fell on the proud crest of Satan. Now let me move, move this because I want to show you this enjambment. Let's take away the line here, the line number. Milton will do this a lot with this word fell. And so fell the hand, the enjambment, as we're waiting to see what it falls upon. And immediately what greets us is this prepositional phrase which introduces um, what was hit, the proud crest of Satan. That no sight nor motion of swift thought, less could his shield such ruin intercept. Ten paces huge, another enjambed line as the suspense is heightening with the enchantment. Ten paces huge, he back recoiled, the tenth on bended knee, another enchantment, his massy spear upstayed, as if on earth, the winds underground, our waters first forcing way sidelong, had pushed a mountain from his seat, half sunk with all his pines. Beautiful uh, epic simile here. Amazement seized the rebel thrones, but greater rage to see thus foiled their mightiest, ours joy-filled, and shout presage of victory and fierce desire of battle. Whereat Michael bid sound the archangel trumpet. To the vast heaven it sounded, and the faithful armies rung Hosanna to the highest, nor stood at gaze. Now the armies clash. Listen to sound. Listen to the sounds here. The adverse legions, nor less hideous, joined the horrid shock. Now storming fury rose, and clamor such as heard in heaven till now was never. Arms on armor, clashing braid, horrible discord, and the madding wheels of brazen chariots raged. Dire was the noise of conflict. Overhead, the dismal hiss of fiery darts in flaming volleys flew. Notice the dismal hiss in acting that sound, but also the, the uh, fiery F, the th, which is almost a hiss in a way, of fiery darts flaming. This F gives, gives way to the voiced pronunciation of the V, going back to the voiceless F and flying vaulted. See this interchange of voiced and unvoiced either host with fire. So under fiery cope together rushed both battles main with ruinous assault and inextinguishable rage. All heaven resounded, and had earth been then, all earth had to her center shook. Sounding in the lines themselves. And then there's this fascinating moment for a number of reasons, fascinating. You have um, cannon fire, gunpowder in heaven, and the heavenly angels who are on the side of the Messiah King are astounded by it. They've never seen this before. But the devils have constructed these cannons. And we have this. And you can hear the sound as well. A seraph stood. In his hand a reed stood waving tipped with fire, while we suspense collected stood within our thoughts amused. Not long, for sudden all at once their reeds put forth, and to a narrow vent applied with nicest touch. I love the way Raphael is describing seeing the cannons for the first time. And it's and it's this uh, use of defamiliarization, I think, because everyone in England would I think have recognized what's being described by Raphael as if he's describing it for the first time, the reed um, which ignited the wick of the cannons. Narrow vent applied with nicest touch, immediate in a flame. Do you see the, the weak syllables here, the unstressed syllables, all there until it 
bursts with the word flame. But soon obscured with smoke, all heaven appeared. From those deep-throated engines belched whose roar emboweled with outrageous noise the air and all her entrails tore, disgorging foul their devilish glut, chained thunderbolts and hail of iron globes, which on the victor's host level, with such impetuous fury smote, that whom they hit, none on their feet might stand. They're standing else as rocks, but down they fell, there's the enjambment, by thousands, angel on archangel, rolled. Um, this is a, not a good moment for the armies of heaven. But you can hear the, the sounds, the smoke. Deep-throated engines belched, emboweled without outrageous noise, the air emboweled. Uh, outrageous, this O, oh, and then repetition of the, of the loud vowels, tore, disgorging, foul, devilish glut, changed thunderbolts, and hail of iron globes, which on the victor host leveled, with such impetuous fury smote. Uh, and then angel rolled on angel's entrails, um, just the language here, it's, it, you can hear the cannons echoing across the plains of heaven, I think. Now, to finish up this scene. The sooner for their arms, unarmed they might have easily as spirits evaded, swift by quick contraction or remove, but now foul dissipation followed in forced rout nor served it to relax their serried files. What should they do? If on they rush, repulse repeated, and incident overthrow double, would render them yet more despised, and to their foes a laughter. For in view stood ranked of seraphim another row, in posture to displode their second tire of thunder. Back defeated to return, they worse aboard. Satan beheld their plight, and to his mates thus in derision called. So he's got them in check momentarily. Because the first volley of cannons have fired, and there's a fresh volley awaiting. And it's just like the British warfare. They, they, anyone uh, in the military at this, at this time when Milton was writing this poem would have certainly uh, recognized this. He uses language uh, from the military. At the time, posture is a word that comes up later in this passage, and it refers to a posture was a, was a command, like load, stand ready, fire. Those were the three main postures. So he's borrowing language from um, modern warfare, early modern warfare. And I find that fascinating. Um, one of the high school students who were reading through this um, a couple weeks ago um, found it ridiculous and almost comical. And I suppose that that makes sense. But this, this had to be the most exciting thing uh, in the late 17th century to be hearing this and to be reading it. So that's, a, that's an example of sound and sense. And I talked a little bit about enjambment, which we're going to focus on next week, how, you, how Milton will use enjambment for different purposes. Enjambment, I should have explained this earlier, but if I haven't already explained this, enjambment is when a line ends without punctuation. And so you must carry forward to the next line to complete the sense. All right, for everyone on YouTube, thank you for watching. We're now going to end the recording and go into a discussion of the Messiah King's um, conquer, conquering of the, of the armies of Satan. So thanks, everyone, for watching, and until next week.